Welcome everyone to this webinar by the Wilberforce Institute. Uh, we're very delighted to have you here today uh, to listen to Bronwyn Everill, uh, who is going to be giving a presentation uh, on her new book, uh, Not by Slaves, Ethical Capitalism in the Age of Abolition. Uh, this is one of several webinars that the Wilberforce Institute put forward, uh, which, are, which are deal with particular aspects to do uh, with the history of both slavery and abolition. We're delighted also that this particular book deals with a part of the world that the Wilberforce Institute has been very interested in, and that is the, the country of Sierra Leone, and particularly the town of Freetown. Freetown has been twinned with Hull uh, as a major capital city um, for, for, for the last 40 years. So Hull and Freetown have a special relationship. Uh, and what I'd like to do would be to play very quickly uh, a, a short video from the chair of the Freetown Society in Hull, uh, Kate Allen, uh, mentioning uh, the links between Hull and Freetown. I'd also like to mention uh, that the mayor for Freetown uh, gives her regrets that she is unable uh, to pr provide a, a short video uh, for, for us. Uh, she has uh, pressing concerns in that particular town, but she sends us good, uh, her good wishes uh, for this twinned event uh, between the Freetown Society and the Wilberforce Institute. Hello, I'm Kate Heinzen, Chair of the Freetown Society. We're delighted that this excellent event has been part of our celebratory year, marking the 40th anniversary of the twinning between Hull and Freetown. Thank you very much, Kate. Um, the subject of today's talk uh, is a wonderful new book uh, by one of the most important scholars working uh, in the field of West African history, also working in the fields of emancipation studies and abolition uh, and the economic history connecting uh, capitalism with slavery and emancipation, especially as it relates to West Africa and to Sierra Leone in particular. What we would like you to do if, if you have questions for any of the participants, uh, and if you could please, please note which of the participants you're interested in talking to, to you, to, um, could you note, uh, could you send your, uh, your, your question uh, using the yellow arrow at the top of your top right of your screen? Uh, you'll see there a chat function, uh, and in that ch chat function, you can put down your question. Uh, those questions can then be conveyed to me, and I'll present those to the panelists uh, at the conclusion uh, of their discussion. So let me let me um, discuss a little bit about Bronwyn Everill. Uh, Bronwyn Everill's new book goes by the enticing, uh, embracing title, I think you could say, of Not Made by Slaves, Ethical Capitalism in the Age of Abolition. Uh, Bronwyn will outline the themes of her book in her 20 to 25 minute discussion, but very briefly, her book connects to some very contemporary themes, especially the responsibility of consumers in capitalist societies to act ethically uh, in their shopping preferences. As Bronwyn notes in a blog on her new book, that shopping for racial justice and shopping and racial justice are not just important now, but were important in the age of abolition in the early 19th century. Using one's buying power to support causes one believes in and to affect change is not new, but is always revolutionary and transformative. And she notes attempts to use buying black to improve the circumstances of people in the black diaspora uh, hark back to the late 18th century. Uh, by the mid-19th century, both black and white activists were involved in promoting uh, active consumption uh, to try and combat the institution of slavery. Uh, and this book and this presentation today uh, will talk more about these particular subjects. Uh, I'll just say a few words about our speaker today, uh, who is a very important historian uh, in, the fields of, in, in, in the fields of West African history, uh, capitalism and slavery, and emancipation in general. Uh, Bronwyn is a 1973 le college lecturer in history at Gonvon Keyes College at University of Cambridge. Educated at Harvard, Oxford and King's College. She's taught at Warwick and was a, had an early, Leverhulme Early Career Fellowship uh, at King's College in London uh, before going to Cambridge, where she teaches a number of fields, uh, including world history, imperial history, African history uh, and the history of emancipation. Uh, she's the author of the very well-regarded Abolition and Empire in Sierra Leone and Liberia, published in 20, 2013, uh, and with Joshua Kaplan, 
has written the history and practice of humanitarian invention and aid in Africa. She has a large number of articles in addition and chapters and books which focus on humanitarianism, the economic history of West Africa, and Sierra Leone, Leone's civilizing mission uh, in the 19th century. Uh, it's my great pleasure, therefore, to introduce uh, Dr. Bren Bronwyn Everill uh, to talk on her book, uh, Not Made by Slaves, uh, Ethical Capitalism in the Age of Abolition. Bronwyn. Hi, thanks very much. Um, I'd like to first thank Trevor for suggesting this panel and thank my co-panelists for reading the book, uh, as well as the Freetown Society and Nick, Claire and Maria Wise for organizing and sponsoring the event. Not Made by Slaves emerged out of my interest in connecting up a supply chain that I had always been curious about. In researching abolition movements, I regularly came across the abstention and non-consumption movements of the late 18th century when people in Britain decided not to purchase sugar in order to pressure the British government to do something about the transatlantic slave trade. The 19th century free produce movement was similar, pressuring consumers to buy goods made by free, that is not enslaved, labor. Meanwhile, other abolitionists were trying to replace the trade in enslaved captives out of Africa with, the, with what they called legitimate commerce in other products like peanuts, palm oil, and ivory. I wanted to know how these two movements, so free produce focused on the demand side and legitimate commerce focused on the supply side, connected up. How did merchants who were involved in legitimate commerce in places like Sierra Leone find markets for their produce in Britain and the US? And how did free produce shops find suppliers of their free labor merchandise? These were the questions that initially inspired my research in this area. So connecting up the supply chain actually ended up being a lot easier than I had expected in many cases, in large part because these businesses produced a lot of paperwork, receipts and logbooks, letters to and from suppliers, and a surprising amount of pamphlets, newspaper articles, and other popular press building a case for the consumer's responsibility for the morality of market interactions in a global supply chain. The relationship between consumption and production, supply and demand, turned out to be important to the people at the time too. I initially thought that West Africa would be a natural place to connect up this supply chain because of the history of legitimate commerce experiments there, and because I knew that people like the businessman Zachary Macaulay, a famous abolitionist, had connections both in Freetown, where he had been governor, and to the abolitionists back in Britain. So I went to Macaulay's papers, which I was pleased to learn at the time were in sunny Pasadena, California at the Huntington Library. And while I was there, I found a letter that changed the way that I thought of West Africa in this story. It was a letter that showed me the extent to which the processes I knew were happening elsewhere in the Atlantic world, things like the consumer revolution and the commercial and especially political developments that accompanied it were also happening in places like Sierra Leone. The politics of ethical commerce mattered in Sierra Leone too, because West Africans were actually participants in shaping these trends as much as they were responding to them. This letter reshaped the project and make me, made me rethink the role of Africa as more than just the site of experimentation. And using this understanding of African consumer society helped me to see why to many people, slavery was a commercial problem and why they thought shopping or more precisely, consumer demand within the market would provide the answer. So the letter itself. In 1793, the governor of the Sierra Leone colony, Zachary Macaulay, wrote a letter to his employers in London to complain that, quote, it has become practice with slave traders to bring out guns for trade marked SLC, Sierra Leone Company, for which they get a rapid sale and a double price in the Rio Nunez to the north of the colony. Macaulay wrote that he, quote, wish the gentlemen who adopt this plan could be indicted for forgery. It certainly comes under the spirit, if not under the letter of the law, which punishes a man for counterfeiting another signature. What jumped out at me when I first read this letter were three things. One, that the label of the Sierra Leone company was being used fraudulently. Two, that Macaulay didn't have much legal recourse to protect the company's emerging brand. And most importantly, three, that West African consumers valued that label to the tune of a double price. 
I'll explore some of these themes in a little bit more depth and then explain how this led me to my view that a perspective that includes West Africa and casts abolitionism as a very different project than we may have considered it before. We think of ethical labels like the fair trade yin yang symbol or the rainforest alliance frog or of labels associated with ethical companies um, like Tom's Shoes or Gap's Red Campaign as a normal part of our shopping experience. But identifying and guaranteeing a product as having an ethical connection, even a product not made ethically, but supporting an ethical cause, was something that businesses like the Sierra Leone Company and other abolitionist businesses were innovating. In another different letter to Macaulay from his wife, Selena, she commented that one of her acquaintances in Britain had said that, quote, her vanity is saying, tell these good ladies that I use East India sugar because sugar from India rather than from the Caribbean was assumed to be produced by free labor and so became the acceptable brand of sugar for conscientious consumers. Even though she was not necessarily a proponent of the anti-slavery movement, Selena's friend was driven by concerns of fashion to at least tell her friends that she used East India sugar. The danger here, of course, was that without some obvious sign or label or distinguishing feature, ethical goods were always at risk of fraud. Selena's friend could tell her friends that she used East India sugar, but how could they make sure she actually did? As historian Anna Von Kett discovered, quote, since slave and free cotton were visually identical, the whole operation relied on trust. The first abolitionist logo was the Wedgwood design, the famous kneeling man in chains asking, am I not a man and a brother? In telling the story of early abolition campaigns, Thomas Clarkson himself wrote that women wore that Wedgwood design as hairpins and men used snuff boxes inlaid with the design, although he doesn't mention whether the tobacco in those boxes was produced by enslaved labor. Sometimes buying branded objects contributed to fundraising for abolition, abolitionist charities, but just as often the design was added to normal fashion in order to advertise the wearer as a supporter of the abolitionist cause. This was abolitionism as fashion. The strategies designed to protect abolitionist consumers, things like brands, labels, marks, and de dedicated stores, were largely there to build trust amongst them that a global ethical supply chain could be regulated to ensure the consistency of consumer political action, and to preserve the reputations of both merchants and consumers as truly and consistently adhering to their moral principles, not simply behaving faddishly or naively. The disconnect between the objects themselves and the claim to morality required some additional signifier of the ethical value of the good. A sugar bowl was not inherently good or bad but giving it a label and marking its association with a political value could work to convert it into an ethical object. But the development of an abolitionist brand as political fashion, marketed at middle-class consumers, created some price incentives to counterfeiting or simply misusing abolitionist products. And so concerns about fraud also arose because genuine participation in ethical consumption often costs more. The inability to determine the source of goods supposedly produced without slave labor plagued those dealing in sugar and cotton, as suggested by an advertisement placed by the London merchants Smith and Leeper. They listed their refiners and inspectors, pointed to their price premium, and gave consumers information about how to judge East India sugar by texture. Charging premium prices for free produce manufactured goods could make up for the high price of sourcing ethically but high prices also incentivized counterfeiting, like that experienced by Macaulay in 1793. Which brings us to the most interesting thing about the letter, the fact that West African consumers were willing to pay twice as much for Sierra Leone labeled goods. The Sierra Leone company was following standard Atlantic trading practice in assigning the goods sold by the company with a mark. The issuance of Sierra Leone company coins, their logo on bills of exchange, the marks on barrels, on guns, and on packages of goods destined for the colony. All of this together created a clearly recognizable visual brand for the company. Following closely on the heels of the precedent set by Josiah Wedgwood and the Society for Affecting the Abolition of the Slave Trade, the political value of this mark was what it signaled about the purposes of the Sierra Leone Company and Freetown's reputation as an anti-slave trading colony. Macaulay and the Sierra Leone Company knew that reputation was an important component of ensuring a market for their products. They worried that fraud, quote, 
will be followed by two bad effects. Our sale will be injured, but indeed we have no guns at present, and the character of our guns will be injured, as the guns sold with the colony's mark are in no re respect superior to ordinary trade guns. In West Africa, commodity currencies based around things like guns, cloth, tobacco, and alcohol had developed as a form of consumer protection that allowed African traders and consumers a measure of control over the Atlantic trade, since commodity currencies were difficult to counterfeit. Economic anthropologist Jane Geyer writes that, quote, there was a great expertise within African societies about the authenticity of metals and other commodities. For populations with such expertise, the importance of commodity currencies may not have been only that the objects had a value in, in their use as clothes or drinks or tools or weaponry, but that counterfeit itself was easy to de detect. For instance, British attempts to manufacture their own cheaper Indian cloths failed because African consumers could tell that the dyes were different. And an early 19th century commentator noted that Senegalese merchants, quote, can accurately distinguish Indian produced cloths from those manufactured in Europe. African consumers were discerning, but if the visual clues of company marks on goods could not be trusted, then the colony's efforts to establish itself as a hub for legitimate commerce and a market for local pro producers who wanted an alternative to the slave trade would be wasted. Macaulay didn't necessarily have to worry. Fakes like the counterfeit SLC gun were not necessarily seen as fraudulent by African participants in the colony's trade. Forged money could be as good as real money in a system in which credit offered by state banks or merchant banks was loosely regulated. Fake goods could have their place within consumer society in Africa as in elsewhere, where originals could be beyond the budgets or requirements of consumers. In fact, sometimes a fake and the demand for a fake, like the example of British printed cottons that grew out of Indian chintz in Britain, could create an entirely new market. An excavation in the 1950s in Nigeria discovered an African-produced imitation Wedgwood design from the early 19th century, suggesting the locally produced versions were acceptable as alternatives for the expensive imported brand. As historian Maxine Berg points out, even Adam Smith argued that we take pleasure in the ingenuity of imitation. For West African consumers, what was more important than fake or original was that the customer had access to someone they could trust who would not try to pass off a fake as an original, either in quality or more importantly, in price. Trust in the shopkeeper could overcome the fundamental information deficit at the heart of transatlantic commerce. What African shoppers relied on was the reputation of their merchants. As the Sokoto Caliphate's philosopher poet, Nana Asmau, wrote in 1831, quote, be fair in all your dealings, even about the smallest thing. Do not dupe people headed to the market to sell. It is wrong, like reclaiming gifts you have given away. Those who are untrustworthy hereafter will have no trust left. Developing a relationship in which consumers could trust the shopkeepers and itinerant merchants not to try to pass off a fake as an original was a crucial part of the commercial process one that states and colonies throughout West Africa were concerned about as Atlantic commercialization and perceptions of corruption and greed associated with it were spreading. And so one way African consumers ensured that the quality of guns was not below their standards was through reputation. If the Sierra Leone company established a reputation for having good quality firearms, they would be able to continue to trade and charge a premium price for a reputation for quality. African traders who purchased goods with the SLC mark were willing to pay more not to pay with slaves and not trade with enslavers, they thought, <laughs> to get better quality of goods. Macaulay feared for the injury to the character of the Sierra Leone company labeled guns because he worried that the appearance of poor quality ordinary trade guns, those possibly made with industrial pipe or with a welded barrel, which could cause injury to the person firing the weapon, labeled with the colony's mark would undermine their reputational premium. Macaulay wrote that local Temne leaders, Pa London and King Jemmy, pressed much to have the price of Camwood raised from four bars, the price we have given since the war, to five bars, and they insisted on the example of Bunce Island, this local slave trading port. But Macaulay told them, quote, that our goods were of the best kind and we could afford no more than four bars. Macaulay wanted to promote the brand of the colony by refusing to devalue the price of the company's goods. 
Semi traders like Pa London and King Jemmy would naturally have expected their prices to rise as Freetown brought in more competition and buyers for their produce. The company's store interest in keeping control of its brand then was an attempt to differ differentiate its products and separate itself from the field of competitors in terms of both price and brand identity. To keep the purchase cost of African goods for export low and the value of Sierra Leone company merchandise high. Macaulay drove up the price of Sierra Leone company branded goods to demonstrate to home markets in Britain that anti-slavery could be profitable to convince people in Britain that acting in a self-interested way could correct the morality of the market. And so Macaulay found himself resorting to somewhat unethical price fixing and name calling to try to undermine his competition. Businesses needed to be creative in alerting their customers to ways of determining authentic free produce goods, but they could also use accusations of fraud against other traders to reassure their own customers and generate consumer loyalty through reputational advantage. So Macaulay tried to undermine local consumers' trust in the slave traders in order to redirect their trade to the colony. He wrote that, quote, we showed them how Mr. John Tilly, a nearby slave trader operating from Bunce Island, had artfully lowered the price of slaves 40 bars in the purchase of which he had no competitors, that he might be enabled by his immense profits on slaves to pay a higher rate for Tamwood, the trade in which we, the Sierra Leone colony, contended with him for. This example shows how unstable the idea of ethical commerce actually was. There was the potential for fraud, there was the potential for counterfeit, and for the unethical business practices used to make abolitionism profitable, like raising prices for African consumers or telling tales about rival businesses. And so Macaulay's letter reveals that even the clearly ethical decision to avoid the slave trade could have unintended ethical cons consequences. So why did this letter from Macaulay and the subsequent research change how I viewed my questions about the abolitionist supply chain? Well, what became increasingly clear to me as I looked into these questions of labeling and fraud, business, business ethics and consumer protections, was that these innovations were happening simultaneously around the Atlantic world. The concerns about the morality of commerce flared up in places touched by the slave trade simultaneously that boycotts of the slave trade were common in Africa as well as in the American colonies. That in fact, for many people in West Africa, as much as in Britain or in some Northern US states or in Haiti or in France, the slave trade and later the use of enslaved labor was a consumer problem that required a consumer solution. Now, many radical abolitionists did not look to economic solutions to what they believed to be a political and especially a moral problem. But for this influential group that I look at in the book, the slave trade and slavery were problems of commercial morality caused by the commodification of people resulting from demand, a demand that originated with the consumer. And so they looked to the market for a solution. Bringing together West African developments with wider Atlantic trends helps to show both how intercultural trade with the region shaped what was considered ethical how the trading relationships affected arguments about who could and should benefit from global commerce. And it shows us what the unintended consequences of ethical capitalism were. Thanks so much again, and I look forward to our discussion. Thank you very much, Bronwyn. That was that was fascinating. Um, if if I could just remind uh, people who are uh, attending today uh, that we'd be delighted to hear have any questions from them. Uh, just a reminder: there's a chat function which you can find uh, if you if you if you click the orange icon uh, to the right of your top right of your screens. Uh, but we'd be delighted to have those questions, which we then can submit uh, to any of the, the panelists. Um, I'm delighted to introduce now the first commentator, one of two here, which is uh, John Oldfield. Uh, John is well known to many of us here as my predecessor, uh, as the director of the Wilberforce Institute, uh, which he fulfilled with great distinction uh, from 2013 to 2019. 
Uh, John previously taught at the University of Southampton and Leicester, uh, educated at Cambridge. Uh, he's, he's, he's the author of The Transatlantic Abolitionism uh, in the Age of Revolution, uh, an international history of anti-slavery from 1787 to 1820. Uh, and very soon, next month, uh, he has a, another important book which follows on from this particular book uh, called The Ties That Bind, uh, Transatlantic Abolitionism uh, in the Age of Reform. 1820 to 1865. So John, over to you. Great, <clears throat> thank you very much, Trevor. Um, first of all, I, I, I want to begin by congratulating Bronwyn on what I think is a, a remarkable book. Uh, and I hope to m maybe comment on that a little bit more. Um, I, I have to say, I don't fundamentally disagree with a great deal of what Bromwell has said, I just really got full of admiration for, for really what she has achieved. So what I'm going to do is just say a few words really about contra context, which reflects some of my own interests, and then pick out some of the, what to me seems to some of the really interesting issues, some of which uh, Bromwell has already touched on. So first, the context. Now, um, it seems to me that what we call uh, ethical cap capitalism only, well, sometimes only makes a fleeting appearance in histories of British anti-slavery, usually in connection with Sierra Leone or the boycotting of slave produced sugar and rum during the 1780s and 1790s. And we're probably all familiar with those cartoons of the royal family living or leaving off sugar and so on. Moreover, there is a presumption, certainly in a lot of the, the early official histories of British anti-slavery, that the idea of legitimate commerce with Africa fell out of abolitionist discourse during the 19th century, particularly after the disastrous Niger expedition of 1841, which not for the first time uh, had held out the prospect uh, of establishing a model training uh, model trading society rather in Africa. It is notable, for instance, that James Hartfield's recent history of the British and Foreign Anti-Slavery Society, 1838 to 1856, makes no reference to free produce or, or indeed to non-consumption. Uh, the situation in the United States is, is if anything, uh, more promising, uh, largely because some of what we're talking about here had a more sort of organizational presence, certainly in the shape of the American Free Produce Association, which Bronwyn discusses at some length in her book. Um, but here again, it's sometimes difficult to place the American Free Produce Society in terms of the rivalries uh, that bedeviled the American anti-slavery uh, movement, pitting Garrisonians on the one hand who believed in moral suasion against political abolitionists who were really, I think, interested, some of them only in political uh, solutions to, to what they thought was a political problem. Um, so in a way, uh, it seems to me that Bronwyn's book sets to readdress that imbalance uh, and does so very successfully. Uh, what she's produced is a, an integrated history, for want of a better word, that puts ethical capitalism uh, much more broadly, I think, into, into the forefront of this picture. And one of the things I think that's really impressive is that this is above all a transnational narrative that takes us to Africa, the USA and the Caribbean, all sites of free labor uh, experiments. Think of Haitian free produce coffee, for instance, that, different, that in different ways sought an alternative to slave produced goods. Uh, and really what she's dealing with here is a, really a complex of ideas, legitimate com commerce, which she's in Africa, which she's already spoken about, free produce, free labor, and particularly in an American context, free soil and free men. And I think it's greatly to her credit that she has been able to tie all of that together into a very, very convincing narrative, which raises all sorts of questions about the relationship between capitalism and anti-slavery. Uh, and Bronwyn has already um, has given us a taste of some of the richness of this book. There is also some remarkable stuff about lines of credit, 
and also uh, some interesting ideas about early forms of economic nationalism, especially in the United States, which I found uh, absolutely absorbing. And maybe this is something that people might want to uh, pick up in the questions and answer session. Um, so let me now just move to kind of some of the issues that I thought were interesting that came out of this. And this is by way of commentary rather than disagreement. One of the things that Bronwyn raises in this book uh, is, and this is an issue particularly for consumers, is, is the question of consistency. Uh, and in a nutshell, this is really about how did you know day in, day out, that the goods you were buying or selling for that matter were generally made by free labor? In modern parlance, how could you be sure that the supply lines were relatively short or that branding on the goods you, you saw in front of you was actually accurate? Now, this itself, I think, is an interesting question. And the short answer to that is that in many cases, it was actually very, very difficult to, to, to know absolutely that uh, these were free labor goods. As we know, and Bronwyn talks about this, merchandise could be contaminated. This is merchandise coming to uh, Britain in this case, most obviously in the case of cotton, um, where issues of cost and scale often led producers to mix free cotton with slave produced cotton, um, just, just as a way of making up the, 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 the cargo uh, in many cases. Um, and it seems to me that one of the things that Bronwyn is hinting at here is that in certain circumstances, it was perhaps inevitable that some producers cut corners and made important compromises, uh, it, particularly when it came to labor and uh, exploitation of labor. Problems of this kind were endemic. Bronwyn makes the telling point, uh, and this is really fascinating, that the abolition, that abolitionists began increasingly to, and I quote, portray a stark caricature of plantation slavery in the US, South and the West Indies, unquote, in order to isolate the rest of capitalism from criticism centered on unfair labor practices, including apprenticeship, uh, the apprenticeship system, which is a bone, particular bone of contention in Sierra Leone, Indian and Chinese indentured labor, and exploitative free wage labor. In effect, all of these abuses were parked. Um, and again, I quote, nothing was as bad as white owned plantation slavery, she notes, and therefore everything else could be described as ethical capitalism. But of course it couldn't be, which is really the point that Bronwyn is making. And I think it teases out some of the difficulties really uh, surrounding this whole question of consistency and how did you know, as I say, day to day in, day out, that the goods you were buying or selling were genuinely made by free labor? As this suggests, many abolitionists found themselves forced into contradictory positions. Brian mentioned Zachary McCauley, who figures very largely um, in, the, in this book. Um, it's interesting, I think, that McCauley, for instance, as governor of Sierra Leone, supported government intervention and subsidy to promote, protect African produce, but in so doing, stood to gain personally. Uh, Freetown's former Chief Justice Robert Thorpe accused the family trading firm of Macaulay and Babington of enjoying, I quote, a virtual monopoly in Sierra Leone, in the process raising important questions about transparency, conflicts of interest, as well as ends and means. It's interesting to me that Macaulay obviously thought it was all right to have a family interest in a trading company while at the same time being governor of Sierra Leone. And what this raises in a lot of the literature, and Bronwyn makes this point, is that it was all too easy for critics to argue that people like Macaulay were actually profiting from promoting abolition, or worse, that their activities were ethically dubious. And there's an interesting argument in this book, which, is a, which Bronwyn has already touched on, which is to do with the question of, and this is an era, in an era of the non-profit, uh, the, the interesting discussion about was it ethical uh, actually to be making profits in what was supposed to be ethical trade. Um, so this is, I think, something that, again, 
uh, is really absorbing and it's one of the interesting issues that Bronwyn very effectively teases out I think in this book and makes us really think about issues like this. Even those with the best of intentions might find themselves severely compromised. Trade, take the case of James Fortin, uh, an incredibly successful black businessman whose sale making firm in Philadelphia, Philadelphia consistently made use of slave produced cotton for his sales, largely out of necessity. Um, and I say that because uh, during the 1810s and the 1820s, when Fortin was working and operating, there was very little non-slave produced cotton that he could have drawn on. Um, so basically, you know, his, his options are limited. Of course, he could have taken the radical action of saying no, but the point is that that may well have destroyed his business and put in jeopardy the lives and livelihoods of the, of the many black people he employed and at one point he was employing as many thir as 30 workers. Fortin is not alone. Other black businesses during the middle decades of the 19th century had ties with the slave economy, notably those involved with sugar refining. True, these businesses were important to the black community, but here again we are talking about competing interests those of black entrepreneurs on the one hand and those of slave owners or white employers on the other. In situations such as these, what did it mean to be an ethical consumer or indeed what did it mean to be an ethical producer? Uh, and I think these are questions that uh, are diff in some ways difficult to resolve but nonetheless I think Roman does a fantastic job in, in sort of teasing these out and, and confronting us with really some of the difficulties and contradictions in this whole landscape of ethical capitalism in the age of abolitionism. Now some of this may be very familiar uh, and, and in a way it is because as Bronwyn and I think um, Trevor mentioned uh, this is a book which is very much touches, I think, on the present. Um, as consumers, we are all too familiar with many of the challenges Bromwell describes, just as we are sometimes confronted with our own sense of powerlessness, particularly when it comes to making the right consumer choices. And it seems to me that not least one of the merits of Bromwell's book is that it helps to contextualize current debates about fair trade, risk, and corporate uh, social responsibility. It's very difficult to read this book, I think, without those issues and the pre our present situation very much in mind. And I think um, the epilogue of this book, uh, you know, every, everyone interested in those kind of issues should really read the epilogue to this book, because it's incredibly sharp and relevant uh, and thoughtful. So there's a lot lots to admire here, but I wanted to end by drawing attention to something else. And, and Bronwyn has hinted at this and I think used the same term in her presentation. One of the things that she's really insistent on, and I agree with this, is that we should not see Africa simply as a site for experimentation in commercial uh, abolitionism but see Africans as active participants in emerging debates about global trade, labor relations, and land use. Um, and this, I think, this idea of agency is very ev evident in things like boycotting the Atlantic slave trade, and Bronwyn has some fascinating material about this, it ranges from that to constructing new ideologically oriented states, mainly Muslim, that challenged British and French encroachments in Africa in the 1880s. Here again, her book fills an important gap, offering a genuinely transnational account of the complex relationship between abolition and capitalism. I think I should probably leave it there, um, because I, I suspect Richard will also have lots of things to say, and I think our listeners, I hope, will have lots of things to say for themselves. Thank you. Thank you very, thank you very much, John. That was very thought-provoking. Uh, our second commentator.
Uh, and just to remind people that we we, we welcome uh, welcome questions, so please uh, please send your questions to us. We have a few few questions already, uh, all of which are going to be very interesting for for Bronwyn and John and Richard to to, to reply to. Uh, our final commentator is Richard Hussey, uh, who is reader in history at Durham University, specialising in modern British and imperial history. Uh, he's worked extensively in British anti-slavery politics after emancipation. Uh, charting the ways in which abolitionist ideas thrived in Victorian Britain uh, and has encouraged us to think of new areas of imperial expansion and their relationship to anti-slavery. He's, he's the editor of the Liverpool Studies in International Slavery, uh, which draws on the fact that he used to be at the University of Liverpool, uh, before that at Plymouth, after education at the University of Oxford. Oxford. Uh, he has written, perhaps most importantly for what we're talking about today, uh, a book, very important book called Freedom Burning, anti-slavery and empire in Victorian Britain, as well as co-editing a book on the suppression of the Atlantic slave trade, which makes him very well qualified uh, to give a commentary on Bronwyn's, pay, on Bronwyn's book. So over to you, Richard. Thanks, Trevor. Um, and let me just say I'm honoured to be taking part in the launch of Bronwyn's fantastic new book, uh, admiration of which I very much share with John and everything he said in praise of it. Um, I received my copy just a few days ago and I sped through it, re ready for this event. But one of the things which really struck me is the fact that I know I'll return to it many times in my own teaching and writing in years to come, um, because there's quite so much to unpack and to um, uh, look into it. So really all I want to do in my comments now is just very quickly to highlight some of the reasons that I think it's a fantastic contribution to our understanding of the period. And I think it's going to be an important historiographical milestone, as it does for consumption and production, what the Legacies of British Slave Ownership Project has done for our thinking about finance and slavery, reminding us of the ways that both slavery and abolition have shaped the state, the economy and the society of the UK, but also uh, of a broader Atlantic uh, world and a global story. So my response to the book is going to be incredibly simple, perhaps too simplistic, um, and just simply make three points. And each of them relates to key words or phrases from Bronwyn's subtitle. First, ethical. Second, capitalism. And third will be age of abolition. And firstly, then, on ethical, I think the book's an important contribution to how historians think and write uh, more generally about ethics and morality. That's not to say, and Bronwyn certainly does not in this book say, that we're lauding or praising the ethics of abolitionists in the 19th century. To analyse something as a historical phenomenon or a force is not to accept it on its own terms, but rather quite the opposite, to try and deconstruct them, to treat them as something that is historically, culturally um, contingent. And I think one of the great things about the book, as John has already alluded to, is that in traversing continents and decades, it rather shows how we can recover ways that moral norms were challenged and rewritten and how anti-slavery moralities in particular became reformulated too often uh, in ways that simply reformulated racial prejudices, cultural chauvinism and the economic expectations uh, of those people's groups and states propounding them. So one of the things I think the book does is showing how many Britons and Americans in the past found themselves squaring the idea of low wages, any wages, with and the underdevelopment of colonies of European or North American polities with their abolitionist consciences. How they discovered and shared self-justifications for self-interest, but perhaps more insidiously sometimes, um, sought out ways in which they believed that they might do good while also doing good for bu their businesses. And so I think that's what's interesting to me is that kind of interplay of not how people um, go out to look for deceptions or justifications, but also the ways in which their ideas about morality, about uh, what good business or economic activity might do, how that then leads them into actions they wouldn't have otherwise taken. And some currents of thought, as Bronwyn traces in the book, did assume a degree of sacrifice or self-denial abstention, at least in the short term, in actually withdrawing from consumption uh, of cheaper goods produced by slaves or of um, seeking to um, uh, pay a bit more or even abstain. But as we know, the abolition of slavery did not mean the end of imperialism or racism or economic 
exploitation. And what I think is important is that the book helps us um, understand, as we're all too aware of in our own time, that the abolition of slavery did not make Black Lives Matter and did not mean any um, uh, broader economic equality. The limits of abolition and its flaws make it important to investigate its moralities and its ethics. And so as Chris Brown had shown in his book, Moral Capital, we need to treat religious, moral, ethical motives as being historical contingent constructions of culture and of argument. So I really welcome Bronwyn's book in advancing the ways that historians can historicize moralities and ethical systems, um, just as we historicize markets and economic systems as cultural human constructs. Um, to try and understand a morality or a system of ethics in the past seems to me a really valuable and important thing, um, and not simply to hold it up to our standards or expectations today, but rather to try and understand why it is that people at the time um, or the degrees to which they could have really believed uh, that what they were doing was uh, good and the ways in which they thought self-interest um, and morality might interact of when they conflicted and when they would complement each other. Secondly, I think the book offers a really important entry into a flourishing field that's been labelled the new history of capitalism because it emphasises that both slavery and abolition has existed within and indeed changed those processes of financialization, commodification, long distance exchange and economic growth that are dubbed and rolled together as capitalism. And however, what I really like is the way that the book emphasizes differences in thinking and practice about different parts of capitalism to breaking it down from being one big thing. So I think this will help scholars going forward focus on distinctions between consumption and production and the contingent changes in relationships between both in different geographies and different periods. Um, what emerges from Bronwyn's book is that these ideas didn't come as part of an ideological hegemony of new capitalist thinking, but rather from contested myriad processes in which female consumers' preferences and Africans' expertise were as much historical agents as Adam Smith or William Wilberforce. And the way, for example, that she uses Senegambian fables about debt was probably my favourite section of the book, at least from the perspective of a geeky historian researcher interested by how scholars integrate different types of sources. It just seemed like that was a really brilliant um, moment uh, in how she was able to integrate uh, the fables and understandings of debt there and show how they shaped action um, and shaped the contours of the Atlantic world and uh, this age of abolition. And that brings me on to my third and final point for my remarks, which is about that phrase, age of abolition. Because as I've already alluded to, the book shows how new formulations of racism and inequality could still get reinscribed in an age of abolition. Bronwyn's book's a reminder that the abolition of slavery as a, uh, as a legal institution in many 19th century polities did not unfold in an in inevitable or a uniform pattern. Instead, we need to understand a vaster age of abolition. Uh, a vast age of abolition, as she shows, considers not just the connections between Anglophone and European, Euro European empires of the North Atlantic, but also the ways in which West African peoples shaped history with their ideas and actions. And I think just few scholars probably have the ability to incorporate in the way that Bronwyn can uh, archival research across those continents, those very different archives to understand what it is um, both in terms of the document collections being used, but also the cultural political context in which the letters and records that she's drawing on um, come from. So I think we'll all be very much um, uh, appreciative of that ability. Um, the phrase John used was integration to try and bring together um, that body of archival ideas and show the connections um, and clashes and contests um, that went on there. So I really also want to um, welcome not only the fact that it covers a vast geography, but the fact that it picks a chronology that transcends the, the legal way markers of abolition in particular national contexts. Indeed, it helps trace developments and businesses across the decades before and after emancipation in particular societies. So it really seems to me that Bronwyn's Age of Abolition reaffirms a vast geography and chronology and reminds us of what can happen when we um, mix up either of the normal frames of reference that scholarship has tended to follow. But as way of a conclusion, 
I suppose I would um, re-emphasize my praise that this is a book that's going to revitalize national, Atlantic and global histories of consumption and production and slavery and abolition. And I'd really be interested to find out, um, perhaps this is something the questioners might well bring up, exactly how Bronwyn feels the history fits into the expanding and very often a historical work that is being done in business studies on consumption, on corporate social responsibility, the kinds of themes that we're aware of as citizens, as John said, but which are also part of a kind of theoretical literature, um, often uh, within spheres in business schools. And so I'm kind of interested in both how she has found and interacted with the literature that's produced there, but also how she thinks the book will be consumed in those settings and the way she, she hopes or the way she fears it might be um, received and used there. But my main conclusion, as I say, is just that I'm sure readers from a whole range of different academic disciplines and backgrounds, but also non-academic readers, are going to find that it helps them think much more deeply about some of the most important questions, both in the 19th century and today. So thanks very much, Bronwyn. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Richard. That was uh, that was that was absolutely fascinating, and, and lots of uh, very interesting points for for Bronwyn uh, to consider, and for us as an audience to consider. Um, so perhaps if I could ask for the uh, the presenters, Bronwyn, John, and Richard, to turn on their webcam, uh, and we'll provide some questions uh, for um, for Bronwyn to uh, to answer. Great, thank you, thank you very much. Um, so we've had a number of questions from uh, from from the from the audience here, who I think have been as fascinated as I have been in in hearing your talk, Bronwyn, and in hearing those great commentaries. Um, and we also might ask you at some stage, rather, if we if, you, if there is anything in John and right and uh, and Richard's commentary that you'd like to comment on as well. But first, we we'll start from the audience first. Um, we have a comment, a question from Ryan Hanley. Uh, the paper made him think. Uh, of the not made by slaves East India sugar bowls uh, that popped up during the 1820s. Uh, he notes that that campaign was attacked by abolitionists, uh, by anti-abolitionists, sorry, uh, as being a, a sign of corruption and self-interest. And he was thinking of people such as James Cropper, uh, who attacked uh, abolition, uh, or so who, who attacked slavery while having uh, investments in the East India Company. Um, was there much of this sort of pushback? Uh, in regard to corruption and self-interest uh, by the people who are involved in uh, ethical capitalism uh, against Sierra Leone ethical practices and ethical, pro ethical produce. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so uh, the, the discussion of um, how Cropper and and actually his partner at one point, Macaulay, um, were profiting from the slave trade, uh, from the abolition of the slave trade, um, makes up a big chunk of the book. Um, because uh, as I alluded to, you know, people are making profits off of um, off of the abolitionist campaign. Um, and they, they are people who have these historic ties with, um, you know, the Sierra Leone company, with um, government, Macaulay himself and Cropper, um, more famously, I guess, um, have all these connections to the East India trade, which then they're accused of manipulating um, to, to try to profit. Um, so uh, Macaulay and uh, Cropper try to form a, a tropical free labor sugar company um, in the 1820s and um, and push it through parliament. and. Um, and eventually they're unsuccessful in that. But in, in creating that company, they generate a huge amount of, of publicity while they're trying to get people on board and um, capital invested. Um, and, and in that, you see the way that they're framing the debate and the way that they're uh, trying to frame uh, consumers as the sort of responsible party in the whole, um, in the whole enterprise. Um, and the way that they're trying to use their influence in government to undermine the sort of tariff regime that exists uh, that they say is countering consumer self-interest um, because it's making West India sugar cheaper. And so if, if only 
East India sugar was cheaper because of the of, of more fair tariff arrangement, then people would buy cheaper East India sugar and everyone would see that free labor sugar was cheaper and slavery would disappear because everybody would be acting in their self-interest. And so the, the morality of the marketplace would correct because everybody would just be acting in their self-interest. There wouldn't be all of these hindrances to the market that made uh, unethical West India sugar cheaper and therefore sort of skewed the whole thing. Um, there are similar accusations with regard to what Macaulay is doing in in Sierra Leone at around the same time, just a little, I mean, it happens starting in 1808, and then he has these sort of intermittent um, run-ins with people uh, because there are all these accusations, um, as John alluded to, that, that he is sort of profiting from his connections um, in Sierra Leone. He is secretary of the African Institution, which is the um, philanthropic body that takes over after the Sierra Leone company is wound down and the British government takes over the running of Freetown um, and Sierra Leone uh, as a colony. And so be because he's doing that at exactly the same time, he's acting as secretary of this institution at exactly the same time as he's setting up his business, um, he like awards him. I mean, he like awards himself prizes that the African institution is is giving out and and things like this. He doesn't see it as being a problem because he's trying to. He's still trying to prove that uh, ethical consumption will be better for everybody. And so, if it's better for consumers, it shouldn't matter if he's profiting because it'll also be better for consumers, uh, and it'll also be better for the producers in West Africa. So he frames it as as not an ethical contradiction because everybody should be benefiting from this. Thank you. Um, Nick, Nick Evans has a question for all three of the presenters. Um, he asks, all of you made reference to the attempts uh, to change the nature of Britain's trading relationship with Africa so that it became fairer. Uh, he asks, what, to, to what extent was South Africa acquired by Britain in 1806 uh, part of those ethical capitalism debates? Uh, do British abolitionists in the early 19th century choose to conveniently ignore this link to slavery uh, in the southernmost parts of the continent? Um, so I don't know who which wants to go first. Richard, do you want to give your give your views on that? Uh, it's a it's a great question, which is a, is a polite way of saying I uh, I don't think I can probably answer it adequately. Um, but what I would say, and I it is one of the the striking things I suppose is the way that um, there tend to be very specific geographies that um, uh, are interacting and connecting. And so I think one of the kind of clear critiques of um, British, American and European abolitionist societies that are critiquing their own nation's um, economic relationships with Africa is they tend to follow very um, particular routes. Now, partly those are, are certain commercial routes, um, such as the Liverpool West Africa trade that um, they've studied and found found about. Um, so I think there's a kind of um, uh, a, a very kind of myopic uh, view sometimes of where the focus of discussion and debates are. It's actually one of the things that some of the American delegates to the 1840 World Anti-Slavery Convention bring up is the fact that their British hosts only want to talk about certain parts of the world um, and generally mm -hmm. ones in which um, it's people other than Britons who are now um, at fault. John or Bram, John, do you have any comments? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes sorry. Um, no, I would agree with that. And and I, you know, as Nick would know, having um, organised a conference on this theme, we shouldn't leave out the Indian Ocean either. I mean, it, I think there is a there is a compartmentalisation here that goes on, and and it, it's you know, I mean, I, we could hardly criticise Bronwyn for not considering the India Ocean <laughs> in this, but but I think it does, what you say about South Africa does raise really questions about, you know, uh, how we view Africa and where we tend to research and where the archives are and access. So I think you're right, Nick, which is, which is you know, um, the best I can do, I think. Um, but Bronwyn may Bronwyn. have. Bronwyn may already yeah. know more about this than I do. So yeah. No, I, mean, I, I know a little bit about how missionaries reuse the idea of the Freetown settlement when they were dealing with emancipation 
projects in South Africa. That is the extent of my knowledge. I'm no expert. I would just say, if there are people out there who want to work on this, it's a great idea. <laughs> Look at other parts. <laughs> Look at other parts of Africa and how they're fitting into this West African scheme. And it certainly okay, fits well. into a long, a long ge ge genealogy too, doesn't it? Because in, in sort of around 1900, you start to find people in Britain and rediscovering uh, critiques of the uh, Boer enemy in terms of uh, linking them to slavery. So there's probably a great chronology to, to build into that team. Yeah. Thank, well, thank you. I'm sure this, I'm sure your, your book, Bronwyn, will, will inspire people to look at other sort of areas. Um, we have a question from Gad Human. Uh, you talk to Bronwyn, um, you talk about abolitionism as fashion. Um, how important was abolition in, as fashion uh, for the abolitionist movement generally? Yeah, um, so this becomes an issue because of the argument about consistency. So in order for um, the supply chains to adequately address the issue of um, the slave trade uh, at various stages, it needs to be, uh, it needs to be a cheap, product that comes out at the end right so in order for a lot of people to participate it needs to be cheap and if a lot of people are going to participate then you need to make it appealing um and one of the ways of making it appealing while it's expensive is to make it fashionable um that, not that they're like they're not that they're setting out to make this fashionable but that that it becomes a sort of idea that consistency is very important and in order to achieve consistency, you have to have a lot of people participating. There's also anti-fashion, right? So a lot of there, there's another argument, which is that people should not be buying things that are fashionable because fashion itself is sort of generating this whole consumer chain, right? And so a lot of people have worked on the, the sort of more abstention side of that um, idea or uh the sort of trend in, amongst a certain group of like quaker consumers who were saying that actually they're gonna you know try to reject the the materialism of this um in favor of coarser cottons that are like obviously part of this um this supply chain which is not produced by slaves it was hard to get you know the best kinds of cotton that were not produced by slaves so so anti-fashion is part of it fashion is part of it but all of it is sort of wrapped up in this idea that in order for the supply chain to effectively um change over production practices they're going to have to be enough consumers to create the demand for producers to shift um to, to free labor and that relies apparently on fashion Right. Um, we, have a, we have a question from Anna Kitt, which I think uh, both Bronwyn and Richard, given his, his comments, would probably be, this probably is uh, something that both of you could answer. Um, she asks a question about trust and ethical capitalism. Uh, she notes that trust needed to be established. Uh, for example, people needed, if you were cons as consumer, to trust the merchant sh shopkeeper, that trust was imperative in that relationship. And it was also important, she notes, among the free producer community, who purchase goods. Um, she notes that within the anti-slavery and free produce networks uh, were people who were Quakers and who were kinfolk. Uh, in short, they were, as she puts it, sisters in the abolition movement. Um, and she wants to, wants to know whether you, two, you could tell us more about trust and kin linkages um, in these linked networks. So a question about trust and ethical capitalism. Um, might be something you want to also contribute to, John, but. I guess both Richard and Bronwyn brought this up in their in their works. <laughs> Bronwyn, you want to start? Well, sure. Um, um, yeah, I, it's one of the it's one of the tricky things that emerges basically um, because because international commerce also relies on trust, um, but there aren't necessarily the same uh, inter. Uh, interdenomin I mean, sorry, intra-denominational connections, or um, there are some kin relationships, but in Freetown, there aren't really as many as there had been historically in other in slave trading ports where people had, you know, intermarried and and 
set up landlord stranger relationships and that went back um, decades um, in some cases. Uh, so so it, it disrupts uh, existing trust um, in some ways, the establishment of this new legitimate commerce um, and the establishment of new cities like or new towns um, like Freetown or um, I also talked about Liberia. Um, and and so there's a need to rebuild and and um, establish new mechanisms for for um, establishing that trust. Um, so I talk a little bit about the Sierra Leone Committee store, um, and and in a way, there's a sort of and this interacts with some of the discussion in the book about emerging idea like emerging liberalism more generally. There's a sort of the abolitionists don't particularly just want to rely on trust um, because they they want to have there be other kinds of institutional mechanisms that can act in that way so that it's not necessarily always personal theoretically in practice they rely on family networks like everybody else um, or they rely on you know deep trading ties um, they you know use historic connections with slave traders even though they don't want to Things like that. Yeah. John, you want to say something? Is that no, I, no, I was going to agree. And I think um, from all the work that people have been doing, doing on 18th century trade, looking at correspondence between merchants, whatever trade they're engaged in, trust is absolutely critical. And, and I think, um, you know, th this is a really in insight that, um, you know, for if you if you this whole idea of ethical capitalism um legitimate commerce free produce you know it's it's a, it's an important component of that and it seems to me this is what I, that's what i was getting at about this sort of consistency argument this day to day how do you how do you really know and ultimately it's about trusting the the shopkeeper or the retailer you deal with on the question about networks um, I do think that's interesting and, and questions around sisterhood and uh, I was immediately thinking about things like, you know, the Boston anti-slavery bazaar and the way in which British women, you know, make goods and send it. Send, again, this is about consumption, consuming abolition in a way. Um, so um, this is a kind of transatlantic, again, another insight into the transatlantic world where women in this case, and, and but not only women in terms of the Boston and slavery um, bazaar, through their contributions across the Atlantic, do build up important networks, which again, depend on trust to, in terms, not least in terms of knowing which kind of goods will sell at the Boston Anti-Slavery Bazaar in order to make the money that will allow abolitionists to do the things they want to do. So there's some interesting uh, currents, I think, going on around um, things like uh, the Boston Anti-Slavery Bazaar. Anyway. Richard? Uh, yeah, I mean, I suppose, uh, obviously, there's lots done on, on particularly in West Africa, but more generally 18th century Atlantic world, trust and family networks. I think there's been really exciting work in the, the history of slavery and abolition recently in, in histories of slavery that have looked at um, family slaving businesses, um, particularly in the ways in which, like Katie Donington's book, the, um, the ways in which a family can move through different phases of um, the slavery business um, in different generations or in different branches of the family and so on. Um, and in that sense, I suppose the Macaulays, um, as, as uh, featuring here, uh, another kind of uh, 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 sort of establishing of, of these friendship or family networks that um, are going to uh, reproduce um, those links and so on. I guess the other type of network, though, which, which I suppose John has just touched on a bit, is that role of... Um, uh, of consumer pressure networks, so um, of those occasional glimpses one gets in letters of um, women writing to their sisters living distantly in a different town and saying, um, I do hope that like me you're going to be switching to the East India Sugar now and things like that. So I think um, I think in a sense the focus on trust in the question is useful just in, in reaffirming that fact that um, economic behaviours are human uh, and emotional and therefore family is as important as um account books and uh, um uh, accounting accountancy in understanding what happened 
Uh, we have a question, Bronwyn, uh, which connects a previous question on Quakers, also with the question uh, from Anna on trust and ethical ethical capitalism. Uh, this is from Olga Sapina, which asked, and she asked, would it be fair to draw a connection between the criticism of abolitionist entrepreneurs profiting from their enterprises and an older line of anti-Quaker Quaker polemic that painted the friends as hypocritical profiteers? Uh, so hypocrisy. How does how does how, how would you what, what what hypocrisy in Quakers? What would you think of that that particular question? Uh, yes, definitely. Um, yeah, and I mean, all of there for sure. This is not the first time that morality and commerce are coming in, into contact with each other. Um, and yeah, the Quakers are are a good example. The Moravians are another example of people who are sort of called out by um, outsiders for profiting uh, from you know their their sort of family networks, but also, you know, um, doing well um, in general uh, through um, through trade, which uh, which others call out. So I mean, and then, then it comes down to, you know, the same people are getting called out for the same thing. So Cropper gets called out um, and he is, in fact, Quaker. Um, so, uh, yes, there's a long history of people who are trying to apply moral principles to commerce um being uh sort of seen by outsiders as as hip hypocrites because um they're still benefiting from other people's i i wouldn't say exploitation but um other people's labor or they're doing better than the community around them um you know you only have to think um about what other communities in in any part of uh, the Atlantic world gets called out for these kinds of things all the time. And they tend to be religious communities um, who are sort of um, trading at the margins of society um, or who are not part of um, the like majority culture. Um, and, and yeah, hypocrisy is regularly called out because they're seen as representing a different moral community than the majority moral community um, in terms of in terms of their purchasing or their um, production. Right, thank you. Um, there's another question I guess for you, Bron. When this comes from uh, David Lambert, uh, and perhaps John might want to answer this as well, because he picks up on John's commentary, um, and he and he and he notes that anti-abolitionist critics like James McQueen, uh, whom David has written about, of course, uh, sought to discredit Sierra Leone, the Macaulays, and all those all all all, all people like him, uh, with claims about adulterated free sugar, uh, in a way that seemed calculated to cultivate a sense of consumer powerlessness. In other words, David says, what's the point, this would be the argument at the time, of trying to consume ethically if it's so difficult to be sure about the nature of the product that you're consuming? Um, he asks, do you see this as a characteristic feature of opposition to the project of ethical capitalism and a forerunner of contrarian denialist and post-truth politics more broadly? So it's a very small and um, a tangential question, but... Uh, uh, Feel free, all of you, to wax on, on that particular, I think, very important topic, which uh, connects, I think, probably to some of the things that John says that you're talking about in your epilogue about its connections with the present day. Uh, so what, what, what might, might be a response of any of you to that uh, really interesting question? Uh, Go ahead, <laughs> No, well, I mean, it, it's one of the things that I think um, Macaulay in particular is is very vulnerable on um, and I, I think um, you know the, the, and that's what I was getting at in, in my commentary I think there is um, there is there is a view that um, I, mean, I think I don't know if Bromley would agree with this but I, I think Macaulay's view is is ultimately that this is all for the greater good so you have to you have to kind of take take all this on board because ultimately you know the the goal is everything will be okay. Now that's very difficult, I think, for critics to to take on board. And it's not. I mean, the whole raft of people. Marriott is a is is another severe critic of of uh, of the Sierra Leone company and everything that anything that Macaulay touches. There is a politics to this as well, I think, and that's really you know Marriott in particular Marriott's case, his reluctance to to it, it, this is an interesting question, another interesting question about trust. He just doesn't trust 
Macaulay or the people around him. That's not just about economics, it's about politics. And what he's worried about most of all is that in his mind, you know, 1807 had been a kind of settlement. You know, this, we abolish the slave trade, but, but slavery remains untouched. But everything that Macaulay is doing in Sierra Leone and elsewhere seems to be about dismantling slavery. And that for, for a whole bunch of people is explosive stuff. So, you know, the, this anti-abolitionist rhetoric is, is multifaceted, I think, and it's very easy then to focus in on Macaulay's kind of dubious kind of business practices and lack of morality as a way of, of dismissing. It's not just about, I think, you know, non-consumption as a waste of time. It's about it's a broader issue, which is about the credibility of the whole abolitionist movement. So those things are tied together, at least to, in my mind. Um, but anyway, that's probably not a, an answer to your question, David. But it's uh, <laughs> it's the best I can do. Um, I think you. Richard O'Brien. Yeah. I, I think it's interesting that you say that, or it was interpreted as being about consumer powerlessness because um, to me, well, I don't know if this came across in the first chapter of the book um, for those who've read it so far, but I, the first chapter of the book is sort of setting it out as, um, as a sense of consumer activism, allowing people to have um, a voice in a system in which they're feeling increasingly powerless. Um, politically, economically, whole bunch of stuff. Um, and, and then consumerism then sort of becomes the answer because that's where people have power, right? So they can stop buying things, they can boycott things, they can prevent trade and things, um, and they can buy different things. Um, and so, I mean, yes, then you can see that, you know, further down the line, uh there is also consumer powerlessness where they realize that actually you know it's not just a, a matter of buying something different because actually you have to there are things you have to buy and once you've bought something you've like essentially voted for it you know if if, if it's standing in for political power um and so it in a way it can paralyze the consumer right because it's it's sort of you can't just buy something different once you know that buying something endorses it then you have to look into everything that you're buying. And that does then create a sense of consumer powerlessness, I think. And I do think that here is one of those places where I would really easily draw parallels to today in that, you know, a lot of the, that there is a lot of consumer reaction to political problems and that people have that same problem of, okay, but like, you know, if I buy, an, ethically sourced whatever, is that actually doing anything about problem X or is it just causing other problems further down the line? You know, if I buy fair trade coffee from far away, am I contributing to climate change? <laughs> like, you know, it's like every, everything starts to matter in a way that it hadn't before. Yeah, and I think I think that sort of, I mean, as, as David's question suggested, it's an easy go-to for anti-abolitionists to point out inconsistencies or the fact it doesn't go far enough in principle. Um, I, uh, you know, it's interesting that people like Thomas Clarkson at the same time they're working on um, avoiding uh, sugar uh, made through the exploitation of enslaved people um, are saying, well, of course, American cotton is different because too many jobs depend on um, British uh, production on that. So those sorts of, of slippery slopes are an easy line of attack. I guess a phrase that Catherine Hall used and that David himself has then repurposed is an idea of a war of re representation in the Atlantic world, of representing to peoples what is happening in parts of the world they haven't visited, whether or not they're armchair geographers, uh, as David's written about, or equally, um, in this case, I suppose, consumers. So I'm sort of, I'm brought to mind sort of those people who, um, uh, as well as arguing about the conditions of um, how enslaved people that might compare to working people in Britain, which is another fam f favorite anti-abolitionist um, trope. So that idea of you know claim disputing how ethical the ethical alternative is is is, a, is an obvious go-to. So I guess it's all sort of new fronts in that war of representation and how far you can 
both trust geographical distance, but also I guess in that argument that John pointed out of, of saying, well, things aren't perfect, but it'll all work out okay in the end, is also a chronological distance that you're trying to get people to trust and believe your representation of. Thank you. Uh, perhaps to, perhaps a, fi a final question for you, Bronwyn. Um, this comes from Deborah Morgan. Um, how does your research change our, underst our understanding of a relationship between Britain and Africa? And perhaps not just in terms of economics and, and shopping, uh, but in terms of, say, the political relationship or the, the social relationships between Africans and Europeans, between Africa and Europe, um, in this sort of vital period of uh, early early imperialism and abolitionism yeah um i'm not sure it necessarily changes the way that we are thinking about that relationship but i think it does emphasize that um well possibly two things one is that the abolitionists in order to make a lot of their arguments described a version of West Africa, which was not real, <laughs> which was based on sort of straw man arguments about how they believed cap you know, ethical capitalism should work or ethical consumerism or whatever. And so throughout the book, I sort of highlight the ways that abolitionists un unintentionally created a lot of the narratives of underdevelopment that I think last through to today. Um, I, and I'm not saying that other people haven't done that, but I think that's sort of like one of the things that, that they repeatedly end up doing um, through their need to renegotiate a lot of the trading norms and a lot of the moral community stuff um, that uh, is shifting from the slave trade to legitimate commerce. Um, in terms of historiographically, uh, I hope that the book inspires people to think about the ways that West Africans were also abolitionists um, and not just the slaves themselves. Like people have done excellent work on recovering the agency of enslaved people who are trying to, you know, mutiny on, on board ships or um, rebel on the, on the way to the coast and that kind of thing. Um, what I hope the book illuminates is that actually there were also people in Africa who were not enslaved, who were against slavery, uh, and who used their political and moral capital to fight against the slave trade. The book is very clear, I hope, that, I'm, that, that the, there is a distinction between people who argued against the slave trade and people who argue against enslaved labor. Uh, sometimes there were overlaps, but a lot of the time those were two totally separate groups of people. Um, but I, I just hope that it sort of stimulates people's thinking about the relationship between Britain and Africa in terms of uh, the sort of uh, emergence of abolitionism as well. Well, thank, thank you very much, Bronwyn. Thank you very much, Richard and John. One of the one of the fascinating things I think about history, which makes many of us uh, love being historians. Uh, is that uh, we're able to, to to escape into a part of, part of the past uh, and understand that past while also appreciating how that past helps us understand some really important questions uh, in the present. Uh, ethical capitalism, uh, slavery, uh, all these sorts of things uh, are things that, that, that are important not just for the age of abolition but for us today now. Uh, and uh, your book, I think, which is going to be read and appreciated by a large number of people, helps us uh, to, to to understand those ideas uh, very well. And I think uh, John and and Richard's both brilliant commentary, uh, but also their, their, their strong appreciation for, for your book, uh, just shows how deep and rewarding and interesting your book is. Uh, just to mention to that, that this book is by Harvard University Press, so um, it's, it's it's available. Uh, from there it is. It, 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 it'll look nice on everybody's bookshelves. Um, and, and, and is available. Uh, and I'd just like to thank uh, the members of the members of the panel uh, and the and the audience uh, uh, for, for attending this. Um, and just to mention, I think we're just going to have a slide coming up very soon. Uh, just want to want to say a couple of things. Firstly, that uh, th this event also was helped by 
Uh, people behind the scenes, Maria Sellers and Claire Taylor and Nick Evans, uh, helped a great deal. Uh, and we have a slide coming up now, now just talking about some forthcoming webinars uh, from the Wilberforce Institute. Uh, so these are Perspectives from the Inside Out, which is on 16th of September um, at, at, at 9.30 uh, 9 a.m. Uh, talking about uh, the, the, the sort of relating re relating about the first half of, of, of 2020 in regard to the Echoes project uh, that John Oldfield is the director of you director of. And on 22nd of September, uh, we have a, a, a really distinguished uh, group of expert panelists uh, talking about what is freedom to you uh, in relationship to one of the major themes of the Wilberforce Institute, uh, which is about modern slavery. Uh, but this this particular panel, which has been on historical slavery, uh, I think has been absolutely fascinating. We will be it will be able, something which will be available later on that people might be able to look at and listen in their leisure. Uh, but I'd like to thank uh, the panelists, John Oldfield, Richard Hussey. I'd like to thank thank the the, um, the, 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 the thank the uh, the audience in particular for for attending, uh, and in particular, I'd like to thank Bronwyn Everill. Uh, for allowing us uh, to hear about her fascinating book and her fascinating research. Thank you very much.